Welcome to the Chasing Spirituality Podcast. I'm your host, Megan, and I'm so excited that you're joining me today. Each episode is full of heartfelt and expansive content that will really help you expand your consciousness and grow as a person. I created this podcast because I wanted to share my own personal experiences on my spiritual journey, but I also wanted to meet others and have them share what they've been through, and how they've gotten to where they are today. If you haven't done so already, it would really mean a lot to me if you could rate and review the podcast. This really helps the podcast grow and reach more people, but it also allows me to get more guests on the show. Now on to today's topic. Welcome to Chasing Spirituality. I am so excited that you're here. I'm so excited that you are deciding to spend your day with me, no matter what that looks like, whether you're sitting at home or driving in your car or whatever your plans are today. I'm just super excited and blessed that you decided to tune in to this episode. I'm really excited that this is another interview. As you know, if you've listened to my last couple episodes, I am interviewing guests again on the show. I did take a little break from guests at the end of 2022 to allow myself to rest and have time to myself to integrate and to um, just be. So I am excited that I am interviewing more people on for the podcast, let me got let me know if um if you guys are enjoying the guests. If you have any uh, guest preferences, if there's anybody out there that you would like me to interview that you think we would vibe and we resonate with each other's content, um, I'm always looking for people to learn from and to share their experiences on their spiritual journey. So. I'm not going to keep you guys um, any longer. I'm going to just jump into this week's episode, and I'm really excited because we're talking about human design. And if you're not familiar with what human design is, it is a very intricate system that really allows you to get familiar with your own energy and how you work and how you operate. And I am interviewing Ardelia Lee She is what I would consider to be an expert on this topic as she has done the work on herself and she actually coaches people on their spiritual journey um, using human design as a modality to guide and direct them. And so in the episode, she's going to talk more about how her spiritual path led her to human design, how human design really influenced her and impacted her and really was able to become a tool for her to use to get really clear on her path and what she needs to do in order to succeed in being a um, spiritual business entrepreneur. So I'm excited for you to hear that. I'm excited for you to get to know more about yourself through human design. Human design is very similar to like astrology, or numerology where it really helps you understand how you work and how you operate. And if you've listened to my other episodes, you know, I'm all about that. I'm all about whatever tools we can use to really get to know ourselves. And the more we know ourselves, the more we heal, the more we grow, the more we become in alignment with our true selves and our true nature. So, um, if you do not know your human design type, if you've never seen your, Um, human design body graph. Um, I encourage you to go and get your, get a copy of that before this episode. And, um, she, um, Ardelia does share a couple of, um, websites that she recommends for pulling up your body graph. So if you want to wait until we reach that part at the beginning of the episode, you can just pause it there and then pull up your body graph so that you can kind of really understand what she's talking about. And it's really going to help you along your spiritual path and along your journey. So a little bit about Ardelia. Ardelia is a human design projector, a podcast host and adventurer. Her podcast is called the projector that projector life and through her work she helps people mainly fellow projectors understand the beauty and the depth of being a human design projector in the world of sacral beings 
Her ultimate goal is to guide projectors so that they can grow, play, and live their most aligned level. So I'm really excited that she's joining us. She has a lot of wisdom to share in the human design world. And I know that you're just truly going to love this episode and get so much from it. So let's begin. Well, everyone, I have Ardelia Lee with me today, and she is a human design um, guide. She really helps projectors on their path and really helps them discover their energy type and how to best use their energy. And I found her when I was interested in my own human design. And as most of you know, when I find something that I'm interested in, I decide to go all in and I do a big deep dive. And so I started looking for resources. And that is how I came across her podcast, which is called That Projector Life. And I just really resonated with her and everything that she offers and how she's helping the community. So she's joining us today and she's going to talk to us about her experience and how she got to where she is today, but also all about human design. So join me in welcoming her. Yes. Hello. Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm so excited to just dive in and talk about all things human design. Yes, yes. I'm so I'm I'm so excited. I've been really looking forward to this. Like I said, you know, I've heard about human design for a few years now. But when I first looked into it, I got my type and I didn't really understand it. I was looking at my uh, body graph and I was like, oh, I don't really like it sounds right. It feels right. But I don't really know what all this means. There's a lot of terminology that's used. And so I kind of dismissed it at that time. And then it showed up in my life again later. And I was like, okay, well, what is this about again? And so I did it again. And I kind of did the same thing. Uh, I dug a little bit deeper, but then other things came up and I, again, put it to the side. Well, it showed up in my life again. And this time I knew that I was ready to learn more. And so that's how I discovered your podcast. And I just really loved the way that you were able to uh, simplify things to a way where you can make it easy for someone who isn't really sure um, a lot about human design so that they can get started. But then you could take that a step further and kind of walk them through how deep this um, system truly is. So would you mind um, sharing with us how you found human design and your path that kind of led you to this beautiful, amazing modality of healing? Yeah, so I I will, I 100% agree that human design can be overwhelming at first. And I'm the kind of person, I I call myself a simple person. I am a simple down to earth person. I need things to be actionable and If they're not, I'm like, okay, I've got to make it actionable. And that's partly what my experience and my journey with human design has been. So I was, I was introduced to human design in, I think, 2018, the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, I think, but I'm going to have to go back and check my years to be sure. Um, And at the time I was um, working with a very dear friend um, as a mentor. So she was my mentor. We'd known each other for years. And I had put together this amazing launch because I was in the space where I was like, okay, I'm in the online business world. I know how to run a business. I haven't had a successful one yet, but I know how to run it. I know the strategies. I know what to do. I know what to say. I've got it all down. And so I was putting together this mastermind and I was trying to launch it because, you know, I needed money, right? (laughs) And I executed the launch flawlessly. It was a beautiful execution. I nailed it and it all fell flat. I did not get a single sign up. And I was like, what is going on? And my mentor looked at me and she said, had I done the exact same thing that you did, I would have had vastly different results. And so that was really validating to me because up until that point, online business had been a struggle. I followed all the strategies. I did exactly what I was supposed to do. And I was not seeing the results that everyone else was seeing. And so I was like, what is, what is going on? What is wrong with me? And right after my mentor said, you know, had I done what you did, things would have worked out better for me. She also said, and by the way, you're a human design projector. And she's like, I don't know what that means, but (laughs) here, go take this and run with it. And so when I first discovered it, it was, so it was over Christmas time, the very end of, I think, 2018 into 2019. And I was 
just like what is going on. So I had to pull back and I had to you know, do that research. What is it? What does it mean to be a projector? And as I was researching, I did not find a lot of information on what it is to be a projector. Now it seems like there's tons of information. And I, I love that. I really do think that that is to the benefit of all to have so much information available. But back then, there was very little about being a projector online. What I mostly found was wait for the invitation. And I was like, but what you know, What does that even mean? What does that look like? How do I wait for the invitation? And so working with this same mentor, she kind of gave me that space to talk things out in process. So I'm a self-projected authority, which means I have to talk. I'm doing what I'm doing right now, just talking and processing and everything. And that's how I figure out what is right for me. So she created that space for me to really dive more into human design and talk things out and process it with her. And then she kind of gave me the nudge to do a podcast. And so I created the That Projector Life podcast. And my goal at the time was simply to use myself as an example as I navigated what I found about human design online. It was more of a, hey, guys, I'm a projector. I'm figuring out what that means. This is what I found. I've applied it to my life. And these are the results. Here you go go see what happens when you do the same um, or, you know, tweak it if it doesn't work or if it doesn't feel right. And then let's have a conversation around it. Um, so that is my very long winded response about how I found human design and started my podcast. Yeah, I love that. Um, and it's kind of similar to how I started my own podcast. Um, because when I first started my podcast, uh, I knew that there was a lot of other people like me that, you know, maybe grew up, um, without being able to really express their ideas and really be able to dive into other spiritual ideas and or taboo things and just see what these things are about. Because I grew up in the, in the South. I grew up in um, the Bible Belt and a very Christian-based area, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just there's also a lot of dogma that comes with some of that stuff. And so I was like, well, if I feel this way and I feel like I can't um, really explore some of these spiritual topics because of my own fears that I've been told my whole life or other limiting beliefs or just fear of being criticized or shunned, then other people feel the same way. And I also wanted to know more about these things myself. I wanted to know more about um, human design and astrology and numerology and all these cool, fascinating concepts. And so I was like, you know what? I should do this on a podcast. I could I could share what I'm interested in, what I learn about these topics and inspire people to do their own research and to really go out there and figure themselves out. And so I really love that that's kind of how you started your podcast as well. And then I've also learned that because I did that, not only have I helped other people, but I've helped myself too, because I can see how much I've grown by everything that I've learned. And so I'm sure that that's kind of what happened to you is now that you started off not knowing much about human design, it just took you down this huge rabbit hole where you were able to really just uncover more and more and more about the entire thing. Yes. Yes. And what, one of the things that I like the, the way that I view human design as both a system and as I guess, just like bringing the system alive and having people in the system, right. Is that we're all equal. We're all on the same level playing field, which not everyone views the system that way. So for me, I, you know, I may know more about human design than you do, but I don't care because the way you live, what you know about human design has the potential to change the way I understand and view human design. So yes, depth of knowledge can be helpful, but I also like seeing how other people live their experiment because the way you live your experiment based on your design can inform my understanding of that design. So, you know, if you have a particular channel and I see that channel in somebody else's chart, I could be like, oh my gosh, well, I know that Megan has lived this channel in this way and she has expressed these struggles or this, you know, this great insight. I can share that with somebody else who has that same channel and be like, look, this is what I've seen. This is what I've observed and heard from someone who has this similar energy. What do you think about that? Does you see that in your life? And then we can keep that conversation going. Yeah, that's really neat. I haven't thought about it that way, but it makes a lot of sense that 
as you uh, work with more people and as you coach more people and you do their um, designs, you realize the similarities and it's able to bring a different perspective to you because, you know, you have your own design. So you don't necessarily experience what everyone else is experiencing, but seeing it really helps, like you said, further that understanding of it so that you can help more people. Yes. Yes. And the way that my design is, I have to experience things. It's really important for me to experience everything. Yeah. So. That, that's awesome. It's really neat that you can really just get so many details just about um, just looking into human design. So for anyone who has no idea what human design is, can you um, explain kind of what this system is, um, how it came about, and I guess some of the basic things that make it unique and what it is. Yes. Okay. I'm going to do this without overwhelming anybody. I promise. Fingers crossed. So when we talk about kind of the origin of the human design system, there are two separate well, there, there is the, what I like to call human design mythology, which is the origin story of human design. And this is where Ra Uruhu, who is the founder of human design, had an encounter with the voice. And if you are, you know, listening to what Ra said and listening to what people who are, I suppose we would call them human design purists, they are like, well, this is how the system itself came into being. Our founder, um, who was originally David Krakauer, I think I'm saying his name right. He was in Ibiza, Spain, and he had, you know, an encounter with a voice. And for like eight days and nights, the voice gave him all of this information about human design, and thus the human design system was born. Personally, I don't know if that's true or not, and I don't care to sit here and like you know, argue about it one way or the other, because meh, it's, it's beside the point. The human design system itself, getting into the mechanics of, of it, it is a system based on more of the scientific side of things and ancient kind of esoteric or spiritual systems. So we have the um, Jewish Kabbalah or tree of life in human design. And we see that in the channels and the way that the human design centers are connected. We have the um, chakras from the Hindu system um, or Hindu Brahmin tradition, I think. And that is where we see the centers. Now there are seven chakras and there are nine human design centers. The reason for that is because in it's 17, 1790 something. It's when the projector came about or shortly thereafter. Um, or maybe it was in the late 1800s. There was a mutation in human beings where we move from the seven centered being to the nine centered being. And that's where we are today. But we can see that chakra system in the centers of the body graph. And then we have astrology which is where we get the planetary placement. So if you look at your human design body graph, you will see those planetary glyphs. The placement of the planets is important. That is one of the things that makes you, you. And then we have the I Ching, which is um, where we get the 64 gates. Those are pulled from the 64 hexagrams that exist in the I Ching. And there's also the scientific side of things because we're dealing with neutrinos and the neutrino stream. And so it is this blending of the scientific and the more esoteric that gives you human design. Now, the thing that is unique and really and, and different and interesting about human design is that it blends both the conscious and the unconscious for you. So, you know, like in, in astrology, you have your natal chart and that tells you about the time of your birth. So this is like, okay, at the moment that you were born, these are the planetary influences that you have, and this is how it impacts you. Human design goes a step further and they say, look, you have a unconscious and your unconscious also impacts you. So they're looking at, yes, both your birth time. So we do look at birth time in human design, but we also look at the, the unconscious, which happens about 88 sun degrees before you are born. And that, so you operate from both your unconscious and your conscious energy. And that is what you see when you look at the human design body graph. It is a marriage basically of the red and the black or the unconscious and the conscious and human design is a binary system. So as you move deeper into it, you will see more of these, the two binaries that are pulled together. And that really creates deep complexity that can be mind boggling. All right, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, I find that just so fascinating when there's different, um, 
modalities and stuff that are blended together because you know I love personally looking at science at science and esoteric you know concepts and I feel like there's definitely truth and validity in all of those things so when I found out that human design takes like you said so many different things and blends it together I just found that so fascinating. And to me, you know, I was like, well, it wouldn't surprise me if this really was channeled work because that is just so like, it's just so big to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And another thing that's really neat about human design, and this is the way that I interpret it, is that it is a flexible system. To me, this system is living, it is breathing, it is evolving, which means that change is okay. And I know a lot of people who use human design in addition to a different modality. So, you know, they do Reiki or they do astrology or they do, you know, some other um, kind of energy work or esoteric modality and they use human design in addition to that. And it's like it, it just blends with these other systems. And I know people have created a unique way of doing human design on their own simply because they're like, well, look, this is really helpful. This is really interesting. And it blends so well with what I am already doing. Yes. Yes. I love that. So for um, everyone that's listening, if you don't know your human design chart, I encourage you to go and pull it up because it would probably be really helpful for you for the rest of this episode. Do you have any um, websites that you can recommend that they go to? Yes. So I have two and they are both um, official human design websites. And when I say official, I mean, um, this is from organizations that Ra Uruhu founded. Um, so I would suggest, uh, and I, I have two official, one unofficial, <laughs> um, jovianarchive.org or .com, one of the two, I always forget. It's Jovian Archive. Um, and then mybodygraph.com. And my body graph is from the Jovian Archive people. It's just a different kind of software. And then the third option is Genetic Matrix. I really like Genetic Matrix, especially if you're going to go super deep, but don't don't do that yet. And all three of those, um, Jovian Archive, Talking Body Graph, and Genetic Matrix, they all offer free chart views. So you can set up a free account. And you don't have to pay for anything. They do have paid options, but if you're just starting out, the free account is all you need. Perfect. Yeah. So um, if I were you, I would pause here and I would go and get a copy of your chart for the rest of this episode. Um, so would you mind going in to the main um, aura types and maybe just talk a little bit about what... Um, how their system works and why they're different from the other systems and maybe just whatever you feel is really important for them to know as being that energy type. Yes. Yes. Okay. The first thing I will say, and this is for all energy types. So regardless of what your energy type is, if you are new to human design, the big thing for you to focus on is your strategy and your authority. So if whatever you are, manifestor, generator, what have you, focus on your strategy and authority first. There is a lot of information out there. It is really easy to get lost in the weeds. Strategy and authority is the main thing that you need to focus on. That is the foundation of this system. Everything else builds on that. So get really comfortable with your strategy and your authority and living that before you move on to anything else. But Let's talk about the aura types. So in human design, there are different energy types and you will see those typically in the chart properties section. If you're looking at your chart, um, it'll say type and then you'll have a word next to it. That word is what you are and that is how we categorize the different types. So first of all, we have a manifester. Manifestors are a pure energy type. They are the pure energy type. If you are a manifester, you are about eight to nine percent of the population. Manifestors are fascinating. Every type is fascinating because every type has a specific role and they all work together really well when everybody is aware of everyone else's energy. So manifestors are the initiators. If you are a manifester, your strategy, which is how your energy works best in the world, is to inform. So manifestors, my dear, dear manifestors, 
please let us know what you're doing. Please tell us what you're doing. Please keep us in the loop. That makes life easier for you and for us. Now, manifestors typically move fast. They are light years ahead of all the other types. And that's okay. They're meant to be. They are here to initiate. They are here to get things started. So manifestors, you are here to start things. You can inform to do that. And here's the thing, though. You are not necessarily here to finish things. And that's really important to understand. Um, ideally, manifestors start things. They get things moving. And then they hand it off to a generator. Um, and we'll talk about generators in just a minute and why the manifester would hand off to a generator. Um, but another thing to know about manifestors, and this is important for non-manifestors and manifestors to understand, manifestors have a fear of being controlled. And it is because of the way the manifestor aura works. Manifestors push people away. Their aura pushes people away. And that's how it's supposed to work because the manifestor, they're kind of, they're often described as the lone wolf, quote unquote. And that doesn't mean they don't need people. They do. Manifestors are social. My, I have a nine-year-old manifestor. She is a social being, but she can also be by herself for extended periods of time and be just fine. Um, so manifestors initiate, inform before you do, please inform and let us know. And then when we have been informed by a manifestor, we need to let them do their thing. And that's where that fear of control comes in. So if you are not a manifester and you have a manifestor partner, they need to inform you and you ideally need to be like, okay, awesome. Of course, debate amongst yourselves how that balance is going to work, please. All right. Now let's talk about the generator. And when we talk about the generator, there are actually two kind of types of generators, quote unquote. There's just the generator and then there's the manifesting generator. And so we're going to talk about those two separately. Depending on the software you have, it may say generator when you're a manifesting generator, but the genetic matrix, body graph, and Jovian archive should say manifesting generator. But just for my generators, you have that sacral center. That is your big thing. You live life in response. So your strategy is to respond. That sacral response is going to be uh-huh or uh-uh, and you need to respond to pretty much everything everything for generators life is a constant response and that is beautiful it is a beautiful thing when a generator is like uh-huh i have the energy for that like great go on and do it your sacral motor is a huge part of who you are and you can use that sacral to build so sometimes generators are also called the builders and look guys my generators and my manifesting generators too i'm including y'all in this you built civilization thank you so much. The open sacral types, thank you for no longer having to live in a cave. Because if the building of society were left up to manifestors, projectors, and reflectors, we would still be living in caves. It would not have happened because we don't have that sustainable sacral energy. Okay. So manifesting generators. The manifesting generator is a blend of the manifestor and the generator or a type. Now, manifesting generators still need to respond but they also need to inform. And that can be hard because oftentimes they just want to inform and go on because manifesting generators also move really fast. They also are light years ahead of everyone because they are the powerhouse of energy. They have sacral energy and they have a motor center up to their throat. So if you're a manifesting generator, you're probably going to be um, multitasking, which is okay. Just make sure that you do not do too much and you're not expending your energy too far. Also, manifesting generators tend to skip steps. They go from step one to step two to step 15, <laughs> and that's okay, but it can be helpful to have someone to help circle behind and fill in those gaps. Then we come to the projector, which is what you and I are. Projectors are a non-energy type, and we are really here to guide. So we are the guides, and we're like the air traffic controllers. We help the energy types use their energy efficiently. Our strategy is to wait for an invitation, meaning even though we can see where the generators need to use their energy efficiently, we need to wait until they ask us for our input. Because if a projector speaks without an invitation, it's not going to go well. No one's going to hear us and we're going to feel bitter and rejected. Lastly, we have the reflector. Oh, let me get percentages as well. Um, so generators make up the majority of the population. There, It's about a 50-50 split between the generators and manifesting generators. So it's like 35% of generators, 35% are manifesting generators, and together you make up 70% of the population. 
Then we have projectors, which are about 20% of the population. And then we have reflectors, which are about one to two. Reflectors have no defined centers and their strategy is to wait a lunar cycle, which is about 28 days. Reflectors are here to tell us what is working, what is not working. They literally reflect society back to us and they can feel when something is off. It's like they can almost taste when the environment or, you know, the environment and people around them are off. So how do all these types work together? The manifestor initiates. They are the ones that start the project. Then they hand things off to the generators and the manifesting generators because the generators have that sacral motor. The manifestor cannot sustain the activity that they start for the most part because they lack that sacral. That's where the generator comes in. The generators build and they maintain what the manifestor has started. And then the projector comes in and offers guidance. Okay, generators, you're doing an amazing job. This would be more efficient. Let's try this. And then the reflector is there helping everybody understand what is working, what is not working, where are we off? They really embody the energy of the group. They're like the canary in the coal mine, essentially. Now, I have talked a lot. <laughs> that is everything and how all the types fit together. Yes, thank you so much for explaining that. And I know that people listening that figured out their type before listening, they just, they're like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. Because I know that's how I felt when I discovered that I was a projector because I was like, okay, so I'm supposed to guide the other types, but only if they want me to guide them. And I was like, wow, like that really hits home because I could think of times where I would offer like unsolicited advice and they wouldn't take it. And I would, I would have that, um, that, that, that bitterness that comes from, you know, me not listening to my, to my strategy. So could you talk a little bit about the, um, the not self themes that each, um, type will experience if they're not listening to that strategy and like yes. how that kind of comes up, maybe how that comes up in real life? Yes, that is a great, great question. So the not self is basically what we experience when mentally we do not identify with our type. So in every type will have its own not self theme. So, you know, manifestors, your strategy is to inform. If you do not inform, you will most likely experience the not self theme of anger. And this is something that I have been experimenting with on my own. There is a theory out there in human design that only manifestors can experience anger. And the rest of us are like, it's more frustration. And as I have been reflecting on that, I... I think in my case, that might actually be correct. So I have a nine-year-old manifester. And when she does not inform or ask permission, and she's doing something you know, that she may not supposed to be, and I come in and I talk with her about it, she gets angry. And I can feel her anger because my solar plexus is undefined. I can feel her anger. And it is this raw, powerful anger. So manifestors, Try as best you can to inform, inform your spouse, inform your partner, inform your kids. That way you do not always, you know, you will not encounter that not self theme of anger. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It really okay. does. Okay. Um, so, you know, for example, I would say with the manifestor spouse, right? If you are the manifestor spouse and you're like, you're, you're going to go to the grocery store tell your significant other or tell your partner that you are going to the grocery store. And then your partners could be like, okay, that's fine. That way, you know, if you, cause if you don't inform and you go to the grocery store, then your partner doesn't know where you are. And then you get home and they may be frustrated. Like, where were you? I didn't know where you were. I was concerned. And then I could definitely see the manifestor getting angry because manifestors don't often like to be questioned about their actions. And cause that, gets to that fear of control. So manifestors practice informing, practice slowing down and informing. Okay, so next we have generators, and this is both generators and manifesting generators. The not self theme here is frustration. When a generator does not respond, they will become frustrated. Um, and that is really important to understand. So working with that sacral response is super important instead of initiating. Oftentimes generators want to initiate instead of responding 
through their sacral. So waiting for their energy to say, "Uh uh-huh, we can do this before taking action is really important to not feel that frustration. Um, I have heard from generators who, you know, have not waited to respond. Maybe they have been pushing to make something happen, like in business, in business, everybody's like, go out there, sell, do, do what you have to do. And poor generators, when they do that, instead of responding, they run into frustration because things don't work for them. And that leads us to projectors. So the not self theme for projector is bitterness. If projectors are not waiting for an invitation, they will experience bitterness. And again, when we're looking in a business perspective, cold calling projectors, I am begging you, please do not, please do not. Um, Now, that being said, you are more than welcome to experiment and see if that works with your energy. Personally, I have never had it work for me ever. And I have heard from projectors where it doesn't work for them either. The issue here is that we are not waiting for an invitation. We are initiating. We are trying to force something to happen and that doesn't work. So when we reach out to people and they don't get back to us or they're like, no, I'm not interested. We end up feeling bitter. We end up feeling unseen, unappreciated. And then we just feel bitter. And it is more of like that resentment. It's not anger. It's resentment really. Um, So the best way for projectors to avoid that not self theme is to wait for the invitation as difficult as it can be. We need to wait. And then for the reflector, the not self theme is disappointment. When a reflector does not wait 28 days, when they do not give themselves enough time to process and to reflect on, you know, the opportunities and options that they have, they will experience that disappointment. And so I think, can I, can I talk about the signature as well? Um, Absolutely. Excellent. So I don't, I don't want to talk about the not self theme without also mentioning the signature. So every type has a signature and the signature is what you experience when you are in alignment. So how do you know you're on the right track following your strategy and authority? you look for that signature. So the not self theme is what you will experience when you're not in alignment, right? So manifestors, if you're experiencing anger, take a step back and be like, okay, I did I inform, you know, what is going on so that I'm feeling angry? Where is that lack of alignment here? Now, the signature again is what you experience when you are in alignment. So for manifestors, that is peace. Manifestors will feel peace when they have informed. So manifestors practice informing and see what happens. See what happens when you feel that peace. Now, I will say that it is also dependent on the other types to accept each other's energy, right? Because, and and that can be really hard for people who are living with a manifestor because the manifestor informs and then they can do. And that leaves the rest of us in the dust or feeling like we do not matter, but it's not personal. The manifester is operating in the way that they are supposed to operate. So manifestors practice informing. If you love the manifester, if you have a manifester in your household, give them a little freedom. If you have a child manifester, one, bless you. Two, <laughs> give them as much freedom as you can in terms of, you know, don't, don't let them do unsafe things, right? But give them as much freedom as makes sense for their age and see if that gives them a little extra peace. Now for generators, the um, signature is satisfaction. So when generators respond, when they engage that sacral energy, they feel satisfaction at the end of the day. And that is amazing. We love that. For projectors, it is success. When projectors wait for the invitation, they meet success. And I have had people ask, what does success look like? What does that mean? Be like, I don't know. Ra Uruhu, unfortunately, was not like success equals six figures. But for me, when I have felt that, it is more, I like to think of it as contentment. It is knowing that what I am doing is correct for me. And that is really where my success is. And then for reflectors, our signature is surprise. When reflectors wait those 28 days, they will be pleasantly surprised at what happens around them and for them. Yes, I love that. Thank you for touching on that because it's really important to really stay, like you said, stay on track and stay in alignment if you know what those um, those themes look like. So you know when you're going about your everyday life, it's a really good way to just kind of check yourself and say, okay, I'm feeling bitter or I'm feeling angry. So that means that I'm not 
doing something right. I must have missed a step somewhere. I may, I must have um, stepped away from my strategy in some capacity. So you can check yourself and be like, okay, take a deep breath. And what do I need to do to get back on track so that you can start feeling the way that you're meant to feel? And, you know, when I saw the success um, for the projector as well, you know, like you said, everyone defines success a little bit differently. But for me, it was just, it was like, I knew, I knew what it felt like for me. And it's almost like, it's just this feeling of everything's okay. Like everything is where it needs to be. It's just this feeling of alignment. There's no feeling of rush or pressure. It's just, you know, that everything is working right. And um, that's what success feels like for me as a projector. Yes. I love that. That is such a beautiful definition of success. Yeah. So I know that you do um, business coaching as well for projectors. Do you do business coaching for all of the types or is it just projectors? So I can work with all of the types. Um, I The reason why I focus on projectors is because I identify with projectors the most and I just felt like projectors needed a little extra TLC, but I do enjoy working with all the different types, getting to experience the way or getting to see the way that they experience and move through life. Yeah. And so like, as you were speaking, the reason why I asked that is um, because I knew that you did the business coaching and I know that you do personal readings for people, but when you were speaking, um, I was curious, I kind of got this um, spirit was asking me to ask you if you've considered doing family coaching, because you've talked about your kids a lot and your household and how you can really interact with the different energy types. And so I don't remember seeing that um, on your list of offerings. So I wanted to ask, is that something that you offer or is that something you've considered offering to people? That is, that's so funny because I'm, I'm at this place where it does seem like parenting or just family dynamics are coming more into my experience of human design. Um, so that's family kind of coaching or understanding is not something that I'm offering yet, but it does seem like I am being gently moved or prodded in that direction, um, especially with my own family. So the, again, the way that I experience, I, I talk about myself a lot because my only two channels connect my identity to my throat. Um, <laughs> so when I, I've noticed in my experiment that I tend to experience something and then see it reflected back to me in the external world, typically in terms of invitations. So I have recently had this realization about my manifester and one of her channels and how it shows up in our family and how the rest of us respond to it. And it was like mind blowing. And it's like, oh my gosh, it just, it was that click, all these major pieces fell into place. And it's like, Wow. And it just really deepened my appreciation and understanding for her and for her energy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, just consider this your invitation to uh, start working with families and start working with parents. Uh, I have a lot of parents that listen to this podcast and, you know, parenting is hard. E even, you know, if you feel like you have all the resources, which I don't think any parent ever feels that way. But I do feel like human design is really something that could really help you understand yourself, but also understand your your children and how they work, especially if they are a completely different or a type than you are. Because, you know, like you said, we're all supposed to work together in this unique way. And if you really want your family to be blended and to work together the most efficiently and to get along, then it's really important to understand how that works. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. Yeah. So um, I know we don't have a whole lot of time left, but um, do you have time to talk on the authority and how that kind of um, how that comes up in our chart and how we can use that to um, move forward with um, our energy? Yes. So the strategy and the authority work together to help you stay in alignment, find alignment, find your direction, all that good stuff. So the strategy is how your energy works best in the world, right? It's how you move through the world, meeting the least amount of resistance. Your authority is how you decide what is correct for you. 
which is different than what a lot of us typically do. So before I found human design, I was a mental decider, right? Like I used my mind to help me decide everything. That's not how things work in human design. The mind is never an authority. So the authority is how you process energy, information, all of that to decide what is correct for you. And you, there are going to be a lot of different authorities and there can be similar authorities throughout the different types. So every type, except for the reflector, the reflector is always going to be a lunar authority, but the rest of the types, manifestor, generator, manifesting generator, and projector, they can all have emotional authority. And so when we're looking at the emotional authority, it's all about that emotional wave. If you have an emotional authority, please, which it's about half the population, about half the population has emotional authority and about half does not. So if you have an emotional authority, I'm sending you hugs. That can be a really difficult authority to work with, especially because society does not like to make room for that emotional processing. Both of my kiddos have emotional authority. If you are a parent who does not have emotional authority and you have children who do have emotional authority, the greatest gift you can give to them is time and space to figure out what is correct for them. So, you know, my manifester came home and wanted to join a like science Olympiad. And I was like, okay, let's give you the weekend to just feel into it and see if you still want to do it come Monday or Tuesday instead of having her make a snap decision on the spot because that's not how emotional authority works. That's how splenic authority works. Um, but, you know, just so the authority itself is how you decide what is correct for you. Yeah, I love that. So I have splenic authority and most of my life, I um, would just stew on it. So it's almost like I was doing emotional authority instead. So I would stew on it and ask myself how I would feel. But I've noticed that as I have gotten to know myself more, that the more I stew on it, the more confused I become. And then I become anxious and I become really nervous because then I don't know what to do. But if I just act immediately, even though sometimes that's still scary, I uh, don't struggle as much. And most of the time when I act immediately, it's not like this impulsive thing where I end up regretting it. It normally is something that I, I receive a lot of reward from. I'm normally very blessed when I just go with it. So is that kind of how splenic authority is supposed to work? Yes. Yeah. And that I, so I don't have splenic authority and I don't have emotional authority. So I have not experienced either one of those firsthand. And I like to joke, if you have a splenic partner, and an emotional partner. That me is and my a, husband. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that's that's a fun mix because for you, you know in the moment. And for him, he has to wait for that clarity. Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And that's um, yeah, that that does make a lot of sense. And you're self-projected authority. And so is one of my best friends. And um, when I told her that, she goes, oh my gosh, like I, that's what I do. I throw my ideas at people and let them bounce them back to me. She's like, I didn't know why I did that. And I was like, see, you're doing the right thing. You're, you're doing what you're supposed to do. <laughs> yes. And something you brought up that I want to highlight is that it can be scary to make the switch to this system because especially if you are a projector who has to wait for an invitation it can be really scary because the world does not understand. It does not understand human design, um, but especially for projectors without waiting for the invitation, it can be really difficult to begin pulling back and waiting for that invitation um, and tr trusting your authority regardless of type, right? So like manifestors, they're going to have to wait out that emotional authority. And that can be scary too, because it's like, well, wait, is this opportunity going to leave? Am I still going to want to do this? Will things work if I wait two or three days to figure this out? That can be really scary. So human design is an amazing system to get into, but it can also be scary and it's okay <laughs> to feel that. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for, for touching on that. And um, if do you have any further advice or guidance that you would like to give any of the types or just in general to anyone that is really wanting to know more about human design, about their type, um, or just anything that you didn't get to touch on that you're feeling called to share today? Yeah, so I would encourage people to have fun 
honestly, to have fun and to experiment. Ultimately, this is about you and how your energy works and what makes sense for you. So as you experiment, you know, have fun. Don't take things too seriously. I am I am not someone who is going to stand here and like really push dogma on anybody. I want you to find what works for you and I want you to have fun and be patient. Be patient. You may not always see the changes and shifts that are happening. Um, you know, my personal experience has been that I have to make these internal shifts and changes, and then I see those reflected in the outside world. So have fun, trust your energy, trust what you're finding um, about yourself too. And yeah, have fun. It's an experiment. It's an experiment. I cannot stress that enough. That's my one three coming out though. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Thank you for for sharing that. Um, And I completely agree. You know, that must be a projector thing, how we are able to kind of give that sage wisdom and that guidance. Cause I say that to all of my clients. And I say that on my podcast all the time. It's like, what works for me is not going to work for you. And if it does, that's great, but don't expect everything I say to be your truth. You know, what I say is just my opinion. It's just the way that I see things. It's the way that things work for me, but, you know, take that, take that on your own and, and tweak it and mess with it and get dirty and just see what works for you, because that's how you're really going to get to know yourself. That's how you're really going to be able to grow and to flourish. And if you're just copying someone else, you're never going to get that experience. So, you know, thank you for touching on that. I think that human design does an excellent job of showing just how unique and how different we are. And we really just scratched the surface today because human design goes so much deeper than what we touched on with the channels and with the gates and all of that other juicy stuff. So if you're interested in learning more about human design, I really encourage you to listen to Ardelia's podcast because it's such a great podcast. And I also encourage you to check out her website where you can, you know, work with her more. So do you want to talk about how people can work with you and how they can find you? Yeah. So I have a website called thatprojectorguide.com. That is my online home. And there I offer human design readings and human design mentoring. So if you are, I I always like telling people to do do your own research. Um, So, you know, go do that first, kind of experiment with what, you, you know, your type and strategy and authority. And then if you're interested in, you know, going deeper into your chart, we can definitely do a reading. If you have specific questions and you're like, I just want kind of some hands-on guidance on how to live this, we do that in a reading, but we can also do some human design mentoring as well. Um, And then I have freebies as well. And my freebies for the most part are targeted towards projectors because that is my main um, audience. But if you are in, look, if you are a generator and you have a projector partner or child and you're like, I want to learn more about being a projector so I can support them, we can talk about that too. And you might find some of those resources helpful as well. Yes, yes. Thank you. And thank you so much um, for sharing. And thank you for taking the time to be on the show. I have um, a, a reading with um, Ardelia later this month. So I'm really excited to dive deeper into my own chart and learn more about my energy and how to use it the best way that I can. Um, So yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with someone you love. And it would mean so much to me if you could rate, review, and subscribe so that the podcast can reach and assist more people. Until next time, I'm sending you so much love.